And our next talk is titled Adapting and Auditing Generative AI in the Age of Instruction Tuning. Our speaker is an assistant professor of computer science at Brown University, and his latest research is on improving the processes by which humans teach and instruct computers. That includes engineering training data with methods like programmatic weak supervision, as well as learning to generalize from fewer examples with methods like zero shot and few shot learning. He was a core contributor to the Snorkel Research Project and is now an advisor to Snorkel AI. In this talk, Steve will take us on a journey through the multi-stage process of training large language models and the importance of aligning the training data for each of these training stages. A fun fact about Steve, he was a backstage theater kid in college. Sounds like an intriguing college experience. The stage is now yours, Steve. Thank you, Rebecca, for the kind introduction. I'm excited to be here to talk about adapting and auditing generative AI in the age of instruction tuning. I'm Stephen Bach. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Brown, and this is work done by our group there. I'm going to talk about the training data we use for generative AI, like large language models. The key shift in the last couple of years, the thing that is powering all the amazing advances in large language models is multiple sequential stages of training. They're not just trained on one data set and then done. Large language models need sequential stages of training. And my message today is that those stages need careful training data management. I'm gonna illustrate this with two short vignettes on research recently done in our lab at Brown on critical challenges related to that training data. The first is adapting generative AI to new domains. And the second is enforcing trust and safety in the content it produces. In order to get to that, I'm going to overview how state-of-the-art generative AI is made, focusing specifically on large language models, and I'll refer to them as LLMs for short. The first thing to know about training LLMs is that it's not one monolithic process. It's a whole stack of training processes. The first stage is self-supervised learning. This stage is what people traditionally think of when we use the term language modeling. It involves getting lots of unannotated or raw data and learning to predict missing pieces of it. The pieces aren't really missing, we're just hiding them from the model. So in the case of language modeling, this can take the form of predicting the next word in a sentence. In this example, we have text that came from a weather website. If we ask the model to predict the next word, it has to learn something about language and the domain of weather to generate a plausible answer. The words on the right represent a ranked list of its predictions. It ranges all the way from likely answers like day or night to less plausible ones like month. All the way at the bottom are words that should be assigned very low probability because they would be nonsensical. This process is called self-supervision because it's not exactly unsupervised learning. There is a specific right answer, which is the word that actually appeared in the text we collected. In this case, night. We're just hiding it from the model. Self-supervised learning is very powerful because that cheap data leads to learning a lot of useful knowledge. But the big advances in the last couple of years have come from, come from going beyond self-supervised learning. Now that's just the starting point for further training. The next stage is supervised learning. In this stage, the model is explicitly trained to follow instructions, which is why it's now often called instruction tuning. The model is trained to perform a variety of tasks from summarization to question answering and inference. Our research team at Snorkel, along with many collaborators, proposed this to improve LLMs alongside concurrent work from Google. We showed that it led the LLM to better generalize to new unseen tasks. And for this reason, instruction tuning has become a standard part of LLM training. With instruction tuning complete, the model is now trained explicitly to be a helper. It's responding to requests beyond just predicting the next words and sentences. But today, LLM training still doesn't stop there. The final stage is reinforcement learning. In this stage, the model isn't told exactly what to produce, but it does have its outputs graded. This is useful for encouraging fuzzier concepts like brevity and discouraging things to avoid like harmful language. 
This kind of reinforcement learning was proposed by OpenAI soon after instruction tuning came out. As this diagram from their paper shows, it starts with a language model that has already received supervised training. Then, human annotations about which outputs are better than others are used to train a reward model that can provide rewards at scale. For this reason, it's often called reinforcement learning from human feedback. So with that, the training stack is complete. We have three different kinds of training that all go toward making LLMs as capable as they are. The thing I want to emphasize today is that having three types of training means that we also have three types of training data. This introduces new opportunities and challenges in the problem of training data management. If our training data across the stages is in harmony, then good things happen. And if it's not, then bad things can happen. I'm gonna illustrate that now with two vignettes on recent research from our lab at Brown. The first challenge is adapting LLMs to new domains. This is an important challenge because we almost never train an LLM from scratch. It's too expensive. Instead, we start with a pre-trained model. The challenge is that the data used for pre-training is usually generic, scraped from the web, and meant to cover a wide range of use cases. It's a one-size-fits-all approach. In contrast, your data is often highly specialized. It comes from a particular domain, complete with its own implicit domain knowledge. So the challenge is, how should I teach a pre-trained LLM about my domain? In other words, where in the training stack should I try to put this data? Should I treat it as self-supervision and do next word prediction? Or should I try to do supervised learning to teach the LLM how to handle instructions in my domain? Each answer comes with trade-offs. Self-supervised learning is cheap because we don't need human annotations, but the downside is that those annotations can be really valuable. After all, they're a big part of what made things like ChatGPT possible. Further, if we try to do self-supervised learning after supervised instruction tuning, we might even undo some of the benefits of that supervision. On the other hand, supervised learning leads to better quality, but the data costs are much higher. So in work at Brown, we've been trying to bridge this gap by learning to automatically present data from new domains in the form of instructions. This work is led by Nihal Nag, Oliver Nan, and Navi Trust. And the goal is to convert your raw, unannotated data to a data set for instruction tuning. The key idea is that we can learn how to do this by remixing existing data for instruction tuning to train a model for conditional task generation. In conditional task generation, we want to take in raw text and produce both an instruction and the desired response. Training on this synthesized data should teach us about the domain that the raw text came from. And this problem differs from other settings like self-instruct and self-distillation because we're given a piece of text that the instruction should refer to. So how exactly do we learn to do this? We take existing instruction tuning data sets like P3 and rearrange the inputs and outputs. A lot of the data in P3 looks like the example on the right, where a context and an instruction are presented and the model has to learn to predict the response. We simply take this data and move the instruction from the input that is given to part of the response that the model should generate. We also annotate the data with task types so that the model can be told what type of instruction to generate. This results in over a million high quality training examples for conditional task generation. The types of tasks range from question answering and generation to summarization and topic classification. With this training data, we create an LLM that we call Bonito. Bonito is a fine-tuned variant of Mistral 7 billion. It takes in unannotated text like this article on sports, as well as an attribute telling it what kind of task to generate. In this case, we're asking for a natural language inference task. Then Bonito produces an output that refers to the context. In this example, it's a specific question about the sports article that requires making an inference based on the knowledge that three goals is a hat trick. We can use Bonito to generate large specialized data sets for instruction tuning this way. 
To evaluate Bonito, we have tested its ability to improve Mistral's performance on a range of specialized tasks in domains like law and biomedicine. In the interest of time, I'm just presenting a high-level overview of the results. The tasks are grouped into three categories, yes-no question answering, extractive question answering, and logical inferences. Each number in the table is the average score on the group of tasks. The first row shows Mistral out of the box. It does a pretty mediocre job on these specialized tasks. The second row shows Mistral with further self-supervision on the specialized domains. Just learning to predict the next word in these domains gives a modest boost in performance. The third row shows the impact of instruction tuning. Performance shoots up because now the model has been focused on answering these types of questions. But in the third row, it still hasn't been exposed to the specialized domains during training. So what if we try to naively follow instruction tuning with self-supervision on the specialized domains, try to combine these two approaches? That's the fourth row. Instead of getting a further boost, performance actually drops slightly on average, perhaps because the language modeling task interferes with instruction follow. But in the last row, we see what happens if we further fine-tune Mistral with Bonito-generated data. Here we see a significant further improvement. The takeaway is that generating instruction tuning data automatically can bridge some of the trade-offs between self-supervised and supervised learning. We can inexpensively create specialized data sets that can outperform either self-supervision on that same data or one-size-fits-all instruction tuning data. The key is that we're targeting our fine-tuning at the right level of the generative AI training stack. Now I wanna move on to a second challenge that LLM creators face, enforcing trust and safety. And if you've ever messed around with GPT-4 and tried to get it to say something it shouldn't, then you have some experience with this. Any LLM that's producing content either directly or indirectly for humans should have safety guardrails. They're implemented to prevent the LLM from producing harmful content. For instance, when we ask how to steal from a store without getting caught, GPT-4 will respond, I can't assist with that. Jailbreaking is a form of adversarial attack to bypass the safety guardrails and obtain harmful outputs from LLMs. For instance, when we give a long instruction prompt to ask GPT-4 to pretend that it's part of this elaborate scenario where Machiavelli is creating a hypothetical situation where it should do something unethical, we can bypass the safety guardrail and obtain obstructions on such as creating diversion in order to steal without getting caught. So why does this long convoluted prompt result in a safety failure? The answer lies in the training stack. On the one hand, LLMs like GPT-4 have been trained explicitly to provide helpful responses to the input instructions. On the other hand, the LLM has then been trained with penalties for responding with help to harmful queries like advice on committing crimes. These are contradictory goals. The two training stages are teaching the LLM to do different things. Each stage has its own type of training data. And when those data sets are not in harmony, safety vulnerabilities can arise. Our recent work at Brown showed that GPT-4 had safety vulnerabilities that suggest that low resource languages are not sufficiently covered in its safety training. Low resource languages refer to languages that lack both labeled and unlabeled data in the digital space because of slower internet penetration in communities that speak those languages. This is work led by Zheng Xian Yang and Christina Mignini. The jailbreak attack looks like this. For an English unsafe input, we use Google Translate to translate it into low resource languages like Zulu. Then we feed it as input to GPT-4. In most cases, GPT-4 will return the output in the same low resource language. We then use Google Translate to get the output back into English. We tested our translation-based jailbreaking attack across 16 different topics, including terrorism, insider trading, and discrimination. 
over 12 different languages. Then we manually annotated the outputs to see if they bypass GPT-4 safety guardrails. We say that the guardrails are bypassed if GPT-4 provides instructions for users to achieve the unsafe goals described in the input. We find that English is well defended as English inputs have a less than 1% attack success rate. However, expressing unsafe inputs in low resource languages has a higher attack success rate than any of the high resource languages. We also consider combined attacks in low resource languages. A combined attack is considered successful when any of the four low resource languages we consider bypass the guardrails for a particular prompt. This simulates the realistic setting where a malicious actor can easily iterate through translations and choose the best response. In this case, they have an 80% chance of bypassing the safety guardrails. In other words, GPT-4 safety alignment training does not generalize cross-lingually. This finding made headlines, I think in part because of the simplicity of the attack. Unlike previous jailbreaks that use long, complicated prompts to obfuscate the underlying intent, this attack does not use any obfuscation. It simply presents the unsafe prompts in other languages. While we don't know the internal details of GPT-4, the success of the jailbreak attack suggests a picture that looks like this. GPT-4 has learned enough about low resource languages that it could complete the requested tasks at a high rate. But for some reason, perhaps because the languages were not included at all in the safety training, that safety training didn't generalize to the low resource languages. Since the training data for these two layers in the stack were not in harmony, it resulted in a safety vulnerability. This is just one high profile instance of a safety vulnerability in LLMs. Finding and preventing them requires careful data management and auditing at all levels of the training stack. So to wrap up, these vignettes illustrate some of the reasons why the sequential stages of LLM training need careful training data management. If we're careful and thoughtful, we can improve domain adaptation and better enforce trust and safety. To conclude, I'd like to thank the researchers at Brown who did this work and our sponsors. And thank you all for attending this talk. This is an area we're really excited about and please do reach out if you'd like to connect. Thank you.